We are very lucky to have as an invited speaker, Leszek Swirsky, who is a software engineer at Google. Uh, he's been working on V8, and he's going to speak today about compiling JavaScript in zero time. So over to you. Thank you. All right. Um, first of all, thank you for that great pronunciation of my name. Um, most of you usually get it a lot wrong. Uh, as Ed said, um, I'm a V8 engineer at Google. Uh, I've been there for a couple of years. and I want to highlight this talk is very much going to be an engineering talk. Uh, I used to be a researcher, but it didn't really work out for me. Um, so I'm going to be talking about embedding an actual production VM in a browser that goes out to millions of people around the world. Um, so let's talk about loading a page, loading some JavaScript that runs in a page. Uh, the naive way, the sort of spec-defined way of doing this um, is that you get your file over the network. Once it's done loading, you go ahead and pause it. The parser goes through, finds some tags, finds some tags, finds a script tag, and goes, ah, script, I got to run this. So it goes off, it fetches that script, waits for it to download, it pauses it, compiles it, executes it, continues with the rest of the HTML. Um, why does it have to do this? Why does it have to block and wait? Because of wonderful HTML JavaScript things like uh, document.write, which means that you can inject any arbitrary string anywhere arbitrarily, basically, into your uh, source. So the problem is that for the actual uh, results that you want, for the actual um, data, the actual calculations, all you need to do is these three things. You have to do the HTML parsing, the execution, and continued HTML parsing. And in a perfect world, these would be the only things that we're doing, um, skipping all the parsing and network download and combining, et cetera. So I'm going to talk about how we try to move towards this world in V8 and in Prime. Uh, the first sort of most obvious thing is preloading data that you need. Um, when we load a file from the network, it goes into, first goes into a preload scanner. Um, that preload scanner searches through the source as quickly as it can, uh, looking for tags, uh, effectively like a regex over the, uh, over the HTML as it comes in. And when it finds something that looks like a script tag, it starts downloading it. Pretty simple. Uh, so that when we actually get to the parsing stage, hopefully the download will already be finished. We can pass, compile, execute, uh, continue. Um, there's other ways of sizzling preloads. Uh, we use those as well, but this basic sort of kind of preloading has actually existed in Chrome before Chrome launched. I uh, landed in WebGo, I looked this up in the uh, Git Blame logs um, in 2008, in March 2008. So this is like a pretty simple optimization. Um, we could also just stream the, the actual data into the HTML parser. I'm not an HTML developer, I'm a JavaScript developer, so I'm going to talk about the JavaScript stuff here. Um, first of all, let's look at this parse and compile here. Ideally, um, we wouldn't have to compile this, right? Um, as I said, I'm, I'm not a researcher anymore, but I'm, as far as I'm aware, not having to compile something means they spend less time compiling. Than, than having to compile something, measured it as roughly an infinite speed up. Uh, usually, I would like pause here for laughter, but obviously, this is uh, no, no one else is speaking other than me. So let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about uh, caching, so that we don't have to do any compilations. V8 has two types of cache. Uh, it has what's called the isolate cache inside of V8, and a resource cache which is inside of Chrome. Um, and I'll explain a little bit why we have both of these. Uh, the V8 cache uh, looks a bit like this. Um, imagine this process that you've had uh, so far and what it looks like to with the V8 heap, with the V8 instance, or the V8 isolate, as we call it. When you pass and compile, um, that creates a little bit of data uh, in the V8 heap, which represents the compilation artifacts. That compilation artifact is the thing that's later executed. In V8, uh, we maintain an, effectively a hash map from source strings to these code objects. Uh, and as we compile something, we also insert it into this cache 
hashed by the source, um, pointing at the, the actual memory representing that data. So that means when you load another page from the same website or in the same uh, Chrome renderer, it will probably have similar sort of code or probably running similar sort of scripts. Um, and as you get to that script, uh, that, that source, we can compare it against the stuff that we already have in the cache. Um, and if it's in there, then you're, you're done, right? Like that data is already in there. It's context independent. You can just run it directly. So that's just a sort of an opportunistic thing that we effectively get for free uh, just by maintaining a small hash map. The problem with this is it's in memory. It's uh, associated with the current uh, renderer. It's uh, associated with the current site with site isolation. So if you close your tab and you reopen it, then the isolate cache is empty. And then when you're loading your page again, well, it tries to hit the isolate cache and it, it gets nothing. So for this reason, we have a, a Chrome resource cache, which uh, works a bit like this. Um, you've done your pass compile execute, and you've created this little blob of data in memory. In the browser side, we maintain another hash map, uh, this time from URL to data. And we can't directly obviously write uh, just a pointer into here, but what we can do is serialize the produced data and write it into this cache. Um, this cache is actually keyed on both the site and the URL because of uh, security reasons to do with this is a write that a renderer is, is doing. That renderer could have been compromised, so we don't want it to be able to write arbitrary data for an arbitrary URL. Uh, that's a sort of security side detail. Um, when the renderer goes away, this cache stays alive. And then when you open up another one, you load your page again. Well, then you can match up your URL of the thing that you're downloading um, or reloading from cache. You can look up the cached code object, and if it's there, just deserialize it back into the DLE nice and easy. And then you can execute as before. Um, it's not quite obviously in the speed up. You do have this deserialization stage, but deserializing is still about four times faster than last time I measured it than the compiling it. So, you know, it's still very valuable. And the stats that we have from the wild say that about 80% of our runs are these hot runs. Um, and if you're curious what the difference between a cold and a warm run is, um, that's the first and the second run uh, where we only actually do the caching on the second run. Um, just because there's three-ish times more um, th things that never never happen twice, two x times uh, things that never happen twice. Stats are hard. I, I did say I wasn't a very good researcher. If we cannot cache things because we've seen them for the first time, then we have to do other stuff to try and get rid of this pass and compile stage. Background compilation is one of the ones that we've been focusing on most recently. Uh, background compilation effectively means taking out the parsing compile from the main thread and moving it into a, a separate thread and then that execute. Um, in this case, by itself, this doesn't actually change the latency of your execution, uh, but it does change for what are called async scripts and JavaScript, where you can continue parsing the HTML um, after seeing the script tag and you can execute the script whenever uh, you, you can get around to it. Um, in 2015-ish, we uh, did this for parse, but can do it for compile because compile was generating uh, code, main thread code. Uh, in 2018, um, compile was generating bytecode, which we could generate off thread. So we moved that off there as well. This background compilation, though, even for these um, parser blocking scripts, is not entirely nonsense uh, because thanks to the HTML spec, the user can still interact with the page while it's loading. So we can still enable uh, interactions to happen just by moving uh, compilations and parses off to a background thread. Um, and it's uh, what we did in 2019 when we released these sort of benefits. Streaming uh, is very closely related to this background compilation. It's another thing that we do. If you're file is very big, then you might not be able to parse it immediately. Uh, you'll have to delay your parse until the file is finished downloading. 
But the parsing um, is relatively linear in the data that we're receiving. So you've already received this much of the file, and yet we're wasting this much of our time not looking at that first part of the file. So what you can do instead is stream the data directly into the parsing, into the parser um, as it comes in. Uh, this we did already in 2015, um, but in 2015 we had to do this on a dedicated thread uh, for this for these stream compilations. Uh, the reason being that we couldn't block other threads from executing, we couldn't starve our task scheduler from um, uh, with these sort of tasks that were blocking for the network and our parses and reentrance. We couldn't just sort of yield it and let that thread continue. Uh, this was uh, because of this also just for async script. Um, the problem is that obviously if you have two files that you're loading, then as you parse and compile the first one, you can't do anything with the second one. So you either have to shift it later in the thread um, and execute them whenever they happen, or you have to just give up on using a separate thread and uh, use the main thread instead. Um, in 2018, uh, we got support from the task scheduler for, for supporting these blocking tasks. Um, so we managed to just split off all of the uh, streaming compiles into separate kind of tasks independent from each other, spinning up new threads as they come. And this gave us really good results. Um, even with the, the existing streaming, we still got a two or three-ish percentage um, improvement in time to interactive as a measurement of loading uh, with Chrome, at least in the high percentiles. Reduce the amount of main thread passes that we're doing by 20 to 40 percent. Uh, it was really great. Um, we only do this for large scripts because of overheads. I want to get rid of this maybe at some point uh, once we get rid of those overheads. We'll uh, see how it goes. Another thing that happened because this was submitted in a real life uh, program um, in the production uh, browser is that we had what I called the main thread bounds which is that this diagram is not actually 100% true because the data, was expect the data from this um, script was expected to make its way first to the main thread. And only from the main thread could it be dispatched to this background thread. Uh, the problem is that you could be already waiting for something else to happen. You could be parsing very CML. Um, the scheduling was a queue, so maybe the user interacted with the page and then you delay your next uh, data packet. Maybe you triggered some sort of calculation, recalculation or delay out because of CSS, um, and you delay this uh, main thread even further, which means delaying sending data to the background thread even further, even though it's already long been received um, from the network. And this wasn't hypothetical. This, we saw this happening in real traces where the, the IO thread, which is receiving data from the network, um, would get data here, but wouldn't make its way to the main thread until over here because of this queue. And you get a latency of you know, a fifth of a second, uh, just the data to make its way through the system. Not fantastic. So uh, we changed this because with some uh, IPC stuff called data pipes, where when we created this background process, we could also pass the, the data pipe containing this network data from what would be reading it from the network to this background thread. And then the background thread can block and read from this data pipe directly as data comes into it. And then once it's done, compile and continue. And it can send data back to the main thread. Um, this might sound simple. Uh, it wasn't super simple to implement. But what we did get was traces that look like this. These are the background tasks doing these background passes. All of these uh, light pink areas were not actually parsing, but waiting for the main thread to forward the network data. Drake did not like this. And then after I changed, our tasks look at, looks a bit more like this, which is way better. Um, this launched uh, mid last year. Um, and we, we saw some good results from it in the wild as well. Another thing that we do, is streaming on preload. Um, I said that we start this background process here the first time we see the script tag, uh, but this isn't actually the first time that we've seen this script tag. 
The first time we saw it was way back over here when we started preloading the data for it. So why not also start compiling it back then? We're going to need it eventually, uh, hopefully, if our heuristics for the preload were right. So we can start our background process earlier. And then that means, well, compilations will be done earlier. earlier. We'll block a little bit more, but that's fine. If our file is small enough, that then the HTML parsing will dominate that time. And the XU will be able to happen immediately when the script tag is actually seen during that uh, main thread task. Uh, this would also work for a parser blocking script, so they don't actually have to put the parser anymore. And we found that by doing preload uh, streaming, we decrease the amount of times that JavaScript was stalling the main thread from continuing parsing by 5 to 20%. Go loading improvements from that as well. Uh, mid 2019 for that one. But this isn't quite the whole story. Um, this diagram isn't 100% true because these the data that we compile off of the main thread is not integrated into the V8 key because V8 is um, effectively a single threaded VM, or at least the, the execution is single threaded and the heap is single threaded, which means that we have to compile, uh, we have to copy this compiled data to the V8 key uh, from our author structures into V8 compatible structures, which takes some amount of time. So what I'm working on now, um, and by now I'm mean literally now, in like when I disconnect from this call and continue working on it. Uh, is allocating detached pages for the compilation um, of thread. And these, these pages are compatible with V8, but not known to V8, or at least not known to the main thread V8 uh, processes, the main thread V8. We can compile directly into them, which is probably a little bit faster as well, because we've got a little bit of a memory locality bonuses. Um, we don't necessarily have to do as many write barriers. We don't have to deal with other stuff that's going on in the system. And then once compilation is done, we just simply move that page back to the V8 uh, just by moving a couple of pointers around, uh, changing page ownership. You can execute as before. And this is coming soon uh, for compilation. In fact, for deserialization as well, we can do this on the background thread as well. Uh, it will take less time and we'll stall a bit, but it doesn't matter. Um, so eventually, this point, uh, from when you see the script tag, and this point, to where you, which is where you execute the script tag, is going to be zero, right? Zero time, as long as you get the right preload, you've got free CPUs for the stream compilation, there's other stuff for the main thread to do, like the HTML parsing, your network is fast enough, and your parsing is faster than that network. So, and parsing is faster than network. That's, that's a question, isn't it? But the thing is, parsing is faster than network. Like we, we checked this. And people didn't really believe us. And we didn't we believe people when they said that parsing was slow. Like this, um, this guy on Twitter was, was complaining that the cost of a uh, startup is mainly in JS parse. And uh, to his credit, like I can see why he would think that. What he saw was this in DevTools, this is back when we had a single thread. And you had this giant parse script, you know, 458 milliseconds. That's huge. That's crazy. Parsing is so slow, right? But this is actually loading that file from the network. So this uh, blue line shows where we finished loading the file. So parsing really only took 36 milliseconds plus a couple more um, during that, uh, that blocking time. Uh, thankfully, we've now changed this in DevTools to say when we're waiting for network. Um, but yeah, parsing is, we measure it on desktop um, as fast as a, as a reasonable network connection. But that doesn't mean parse time doesn't map at all, right? We've got um, small scripts, as I mentioned, that are still on the screen, and streamed, inline scripts, which is when you don't put a source, but you embed your JavaScript directly in the HTML, lazy compilations, we do plenty of lazy compilations. Um, so your script served from cache, well, those sh shouldn't have much network time, or they still have browser IPC time. So we still want to improve in parse time. Um, and we realized that our parser is slowed down by this death by a thousand paper cuts. Like you've got slowdowns here, you've got some other slowdowns there. There wasn't like a single location where it was slow. Um, so we ended up trying to speed it up. 
by the opposite, revitalizing it with uh, a thousand patches. And a thousand isn't really much of an overestimate. Um, a couple of us did about 400 patches trying to improve the parser. And we ended up improving the parser speed, just the raw parser speed by 40-ish percent with small tweaks, or reducing, uh, sorry, parse time by about 40 percent, improving parse time on other benchmarks by uh, 2x-ish. By the way, if you're interested in the previous benchmark talk, all these uh, green green eyes and, and black exclamation marks are our regression uh, detection or our improvement detection. Um, yeah, uh, the bar signs just you know dropped across the board uh, across multiple versions, and this was just a whole bunch of small things. Um, for example, we in an outlined fast paths for uh, different stages in the path. Um, if you look at this right hand side assignment to the left hand side, this left hand side can be pretty much any arbitrary expression. And the code for that looked something like this. This is, well, this is an engineering talk, this code on the slide. Um, and this, you know, it, it, you don't really have to look at what it does, but you can see how it switches over different kinds of, of tokens from the tokenizer. Um, and it had very, very deep stack traces. This is a flame graph of the execution of, of this, um, this function, I think. And you know, this could be an, an object property, it could be an array access, it could be something that so long it doesn't fit on the slide. Most of the time, it's just going to be a variable that you're assigning to, right? So we can take our uh, left hand side expression parser and change it to have a fast path, which is some sort of member access, either a variable or, or a property. If that works, then we, then we just emit it directly. If it doesn't, then we fall through into, uh, into a continuation, which is slow. The simple path is inlined. The complex path is forced to be outlined. And our flame charts drop to something like this. Measurable performance imp uh, improvement from you know, an, an engineering a refactoring. Uh, we changed a whole bunch of stuff to use lookup tables. Um, it sounds dumb, but we had switch statements like this, and it was faster to look up our tokens inside of a lookup table. For some reason, the compiler didn't do this, and have uh, switches on individual tokens rather than on individual characters. We did range checks for enum values. Uh, so we used to have code something like this, um, checking if something is an identifier with a bunch of comparisons and a bunch of ors. Uh, we just reorganized our enums to have all of these in a single range. Changes to be a single comparison and a single branch and measurable impact. Perfect hashing is something that we did for identifiers. It's a known technique, but we weren't using it. Uh, something like getting a keyword from a string, uh, detecting if a string is a keyword. Uh, it used to be something that was roughly the moral equivalent of this. Um, we decided, hey, let's engineer this, let's make it fast, let's make it a state machine. Uh, switching over individual characters and trying to sort of handcraft this fast path. Um, and then eventually we just switched to using a perfect hash from, from GProf, uh, checking two characters and making the outcome table, measurable performance impact, one ish percent. All of these things do not change bigger complexity. We went from linear time to linear time, but they do change. Like the, the constant values in a production VM do matter, and they probably matter in research VMs as well. And the thing is, you know, we've all heard it, right? Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Don't bother optimizing things. That's for things that are premature. Now, mature optimization, right, must therefore be the square of all good. Feel free to use that one. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's how we approached the problem of, uh, of parse and compile, um, both from a macro approach, these giant re-architecturings to use more threads and to use caching and uh, you know, to try and move these large chunks uh, off the main thread and, and move them elsewhere, and micro optimizations at both ends of the scale where we changed uh, switches into lookup tables. And it might not sound like much, but our 
a loading metric on Facebook. It's uh, what we call our, our TTS or Time to Shakira metric on Facebook. You can see how across uh, a year or so of Chrome, it's the, the time is visibly reduced for users. So that's compiling JavaScript in zero time, subject to terms and conditions. Uh, I'll take questions. <laughs>